So uh, welcome, welcome colleagues, uh, excellencies to this uh, lunchtime uh, side event. Um, uh, welcome to this event uh, on advancing the migration health research agenda for evidence-informed policy and practice during the IOM Council. So this council is a rather special one, uh, not only because of our new DG, this is his first council, but also because of the Global Compact on Migration, the GCM, which will be formally adopted, as we know, next week, actually 11 December in Marrakesh. The GCM aims uh, to build a greater consensus on managing the world's movements of migrants and uphold the human rights of migrants and their families. And we are very glad that health is integrated in half of the GCM objectives. Interestingly, and one of the reasons behind this lunch event is the first GCM objective, which focuses on data. It says that member states commit to strengthen the global evidence based on international migration by improving and investing in the collection, analysis and dissemination of accurate, reliable and comparable data. It furthermore mentioned the development of country migration profiles, which include disaggregated data on all migration relevant aspects in national contexts, including health. We think that this panel with specialized IOM colleagues, academia and WHO is very timely to drive the migrant health agenda further. At IOM, we firmly adhere to advancing an evidence-informed approach in our health interventions. Speaking for a migration health division that offers health services to its beneficiaries, we work with refugees and migrants world over and have close encounters with them. This is how we learn. Uh, this is how we have relevant data, and this is why we want to make sure that our experiences are shared. But also, this is why we are strongly committed in working with our member states, partners like WHO, and academic institutions in developing and maintaining knowledge platforms and research networks to advance data and research in migration and health. I'm therefore proud to announce that IOM launched an open access migration and health research portal this year. Um, <clears throat> the site serves as an information platform for member states, partners, researchers, media, interested in the work, of, in the work that IOM is undertaking. So far, the portal maps some 1,800 migration and health related projects IOM has implemented since 2006, uh, covering all regions of the world. We have also generated a total of some 650 technical publications on migration and health within that same period of time. In addition, in partnership with academics globally, we launched the MADRI initiative in 2016. This is a migration health uh, development research initiative. It's a global network bringing together researchers and practitioners to advance migration health. This session will tell us more about this new partnership as well as the portal I just mentioned. Of course, we can do more and we hope that the GCM will bring us an additional boost to further interest and resources to develop high yield analytical briefs and applied research that enable member states to make better informed decisions around migration and health on the basis of their own migration realities and capacities. I'll end here and would like to introduce uh, our moderator, Paul Simpson, editor of the BMJ, the British Medical Journal. Paul, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. So it's very exciting to be here for me. Um, it's uh, outside of the usual uh, health sector silo uh, that uh, medical journal editors tend to inhabit. Um, I think perhaps that's in some small way the SDGs working their magic in that uh, it gives us a license to move outside of our, our silos. Um, so I would like to um, introduce the panel. Um, we're planning for about 45 minutes of discussion amongst the panel members. And then uh, we're hoping to open it up to the, um, to the floor for, for questions from the floor. So um, I will introduce from this end, we have um, Col Colwick Ramage, who is the head of global health research and epidemiology in the Migration and Health Division of IOM. We've got um, Michaela Told, who's uh, from the Graduate, Graduate Institute here in Geneva. Um, Michaela is the Executive Director of the Global Health Center. Um, we have uh, Frank uh, Laxko, who is the Director of the IOM's uh, Migration uh, Data Analysis Center in Berlin. 
we have uh, Ursula Trummer, who is um, the co-founder and head of the Center for Health and Migration in Vienna, Austria. And um, at the end, we have um, Matteo uh, Signol, who is the team leader uh, of research in the Global TB program at the WHO. So um, to, to begin with, I, I thought it would be useful for us to, to really get a grounding for the discussion about what data is being collected, what data is available, um, and how is this being used to inform policy now? Um, and, and Frank, I wondered if you would be, uh, I, th I thought that you would be the best person to start that discussion. So I wondered if you could give us three or four minutes on, um, sure. on the data yeah. that's available. Okay, good afternoon everyone. I'm the odd person out on this panel because I'm not the migration and health specialist, um, but I'm supposed to know something about migration data and statistics. Uh, so let me try and frame the discussion by saying that I think across the world and across the UN system over the years, everyone has agreed that we need better data on international migration. It is a recommendation that has been made over and over again. In fact, if we trace back the history of this discussion, we can go all the way back to 1891 in Vienna and I have somebody from Vienna next to me, um, and the international statistics meeting there, which first called for better data on settled migrants. So um, despite the fact that there are some skeptics out there who say that, well, it's all very well to collect data on migration, but it doesn't have an impact on policy, um, we believe that data is not an end in itself and that data is absolutely key if you want to design an intervention or a program or a policy. You need to know what is the challenge that you want to address. You need to be able to then design your instruments and use data to inform your policies and programs and then use data really to assess how well you're doing and to be able to evaluate what you're doing. Now, despite the fact that there is this consensus um, in favor of improving data on migration, we've actually seen relatively little progress in this field over the years. That's a generalization. There have been some significant improvements, but nonetheless, the um, former special representative to the UN Secretary General, uh, Peter Sutherland, when he issued his report uh, one or two years ago, one of the key messages of his report was the fact that we lack basic information, basic data on international migration. And I'll just give you a few figures, and maybe I'll stop and then come back again, because I know you're gonna ask some more questions. But just to give you some examples of where we are today. If you take Asia and the 48, 48 countries or so in Asia, less than a quarter of those countries have been able to rep report da data on migration flows to the UN Statistics Division in recent years. If you think about um, official statistics on international migration for Africa, 17% um, of the countries in Africa have not been able to report any official statistics to the UN since 2005. If you think about censuses, which are the key source of data on international migration, many countries around the world, about half of the countries around the world, do not even ask a simple question such as, when did the migrant arrive in your country? Um, and we could go on like that. So um, there are a number of basic challenges. Some of it's to do with lack of data. Um, but the other challenges we face are that there is more and more data being produced today through digital devices, new technologies, and we're not making the best use of this information. Also, organizations like IOM are producing more and more data through our operational work and other agencies. Some of this data is shared effectively, some not. So the challenge that we face is not simply to improve the collection of data in the future, but also to make better use of the data that is currently available to inform um, policies and programs in this area. 
So I'll, I think I'll stop there and I'll come back again, I guess. Thank, thank you, Frank. That's really, that's really helpful. Um, so we've heard about some of the, the challenges there of, uh, in, in sort of having the data at hand. But I wonder whether, I mean, Cole, perhaps you could provide us with some, like a good example of how data is being used to, to inform policy in health. Thanks, thanks, Paul. Uh, I think um, I'd like to perhaps highlight a, a country case study um, from, in this case, Sri Lanka, where a government um, drove essentially a evidence-informed migration health policy process where um, data and research was the heart of that um, migration health policy process. And perhaps I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time um, talking about how that process um, was initiated and, and catalyzed. I think that's useful for, for many of the, 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 the countries here as well. Um, so Sri Lanka has a dynamic migration flow. It's considered a labor sending country uh, with around two million migrants going to uh, many parts of the Gulf as migrant workers, but it's also a labor receiving country, uh, receiving um, uh, migrant labor from China and India that fuels a lot of the development um, projects in, in the country. Um, the country also went through a, a, a protracted civil conflict and there was a, a dynamic of returning refugees back into Sri Lanka, but also internal mobility in terms of displacement. So it's, it's a, it was a dynamic, um, uh, 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 it was a dynamic migration flow. In this context, the government of Sri Lanka led a migration health policy process through the conduit of the Ministry of Health. And they did that through what they considered an intersectoral approach. So they had this approach where, although it was the Ministry of Health that was leading the process, they engaged um, uh, other ministries, uh, Minister of Interior, Minister of Immigration, for example. Um, what was, I think, the key point here was that they utilized the local research community or the indigenous research institutions to drive the, the data because what, what happened is that th there was very little data existing to make decisions around health status, for example, of those labor migrants that go to, to the Gulf states or indeed what the health consequences to their families left behind are. This process was quite long. Um, there was a national research commission uh, under the the, the stewardship of the, the Minister of Health. Um, it took around two to three years until the data was distilled, and the data was distilled in forums where researchers got together in the same room as policymakers and, and talked about these findings in the context of, of health status of different mobile population groups. Out of that came a, a, a national migration health policy process um, out of that came recommendations such as including a migration module in health surveys, for example. So really, the, the policy process took around six years, but what came out of that was a, a participatory approach, uh, an intersectoral approach to, to driving data and evidence. Cole, can I ask you a quick question, which is, so what was the enabling environment that, that led to that working? Because it's obviously quite a long process. It, it takes some commitment. What, what was it that? Thanks. Uh, it's, it's so, so this was around 2009. It was the end of the, the civil conflict in Sri Lanka. There was a, a real momentum for the peace dividend. And I think there was a concerted effort amongst um, the government of the time to really invest uh, in, in looking at migration for development. And we all, all hear the mantra around migration for development, but the government asked a question about what, what, was there any social and health costs to, to the dependency on, for example, labor migrants. But there was also the practical questions about returning refugees and the different uh, health gradients or epidemiological gradients as we call them, um, and questions around Sri Lanka reaching malaria elimination. and. Um, imported cases as being the last bastion of defense of, of uh, reactivation of malaria. So I think there was a confluence of factors that led to the government making a decision that we need to have some sort of migration health policy, but we need to do so through evidence. Great, thank you very much. Um, I th think perhaps I could turn to uh, Matteo now. So Matteo, you're working in the 
the TB program, and obviously that's a big, there's a big challenge there of, um, um, around migration. And I wonder if you could sort of reflect on your experiences. Yeah, thank you. Uh, of course, TB is, is only one of the many, many health uh, issues, but uh, it's, it is uh, still uh, one of the, actually among the top 10 uh, causes of mortality globally, and it's, it's, it's the top killer from infectious disease. Uh, it is, uh, we are quite lucky uh, in TB because we have a, a quite solid uh, notification system in countries. The big problem there is that for many years has been confined to Ministry of Health. Uh, we have been talking and working exclusively with MOH. And, and uh, we know very well that maybe 40% of our estimated TB cases globally are missing, are not found. Are not found not because, you know, not just because we are not able to detect the disease, but because we don't get the report. And in, many, in some countries, up to 20, 30% of TB patients are among migrants, both you know, internal migration, uh, displaced population, and uh, you know, uh, cross-country migration. So one of the, one of the uh, I would say, elements, new elements that uh, um, we want to basically put on, on the agenda and, and um, is uh, uh, to work multi-sectorally in countries. And there, are, there is a movement now to ensure that not only Ministry of Health are involved when it comes to reporting, but also uh, all the other ministers uh, in finance, interior, uh, research and development. And uh, uh, we think this is crucial if uh, we really want to move uh, forward uh, and, and try to find uh, and treat tuberculosis. As you understand very well, tuberculosis is an infectious disease, so uh, it, we need to ensure that not only patients are diagnosed, but also they are kept on treatment mm -hmm. for a quite long period of time, which if, if uh, we talk about susceptible TB, normal TB is six months. So it's a long period of time. So we have clearly huge problems related to uh, the capacity of Ministry of Health to ensure that the, the treatment is, uh, patients are, are, are adhering to treatment. Um, so there is clearly now a much, much stronger political will to work uh, not just with the uh, uh, Ministry of Health, but with the entire sort of government. And uh, we recently had uh, an high level meeting on tuberculosis where, where this, is, this statement is very clear. And the issue of migrants has been, is, is, is in declaration, is, is very, very strong there. The other point is that uh, uh, we need to rethink our uh, surveillance system, our recording system, our data system. And uh, as was previously said, uh, we, we lack that. We don't get that information. You know, we don't get in information on TB, tuberculosis in migrants uh, at the moment. But wh what is happening is, is that there are uh, uh, multiple, multi-country uh, TB research collaborations. Uh, these are small hubs, uh, one, for example, in Sadek, one in Western and uh, Central Africa, another one in Asia, another one in Russia and Eastern Europe, where um, uh, researchers and uh, uh, MOH people, Ministry of Health people, program people work together to address um, research issues in that case. So migration could definitely be uh, one of the elements and uh, could uh, uh, of, this, of these uh, research projects. And uh, that could be like, a, those could be platform that could help us uh, getting you know, uh, more data. So this is, this is uh, the way we would like to go. The, the research platform that you're talking about, that's, 
cross borders. So. Yes, those platforms are, are, are uh, uh, multi-country platforms, but of countries that are neighboring. As I said, one, for example, in the SADC, another one is, 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 is in uh, Western and Central Africa. And uh, uh, the beauty of those uh, platforms is that they are managed by the countries themselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are inputs from, uh, of course, international organizations, and WHO is part of those. And they uh, uh, are uh, basically led by researchers and uh, program people at, at the same level. So it's a platform where, where important research issues, like, for example, the one that we are discussing today, could be uh, addressed through, through, you know, uh, through work together. <clears throat> so, so we've been talking about r research, um, uh, kind of cross-border collaboration. I, I wanted to sort of move the discussion towards um, a conversation about universal health coverage, because this is obviously a, a key issue. Um, and, uh, and I think um, perhaps, um, Ursula, you might be able to kind of shed some uh, light on this. Um, one of the things that um, is emerging is how um, the economic um, evidence around uh, providing health care for migrants. And I wondered whether you might be able to, um, to make some comments there. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, when it comes to evidence on economics and health and migration, you might presume, and it, it is very often presumed, that it, is more, it gets more expensive if you include migrants into health care if you open up, so to speak, the system, then it becomes uh, more expensive. And uh, there are stakeholders who, who uh, stress this. Um, there are several studies around this topic available already. So there is some evidence. And this evidence says the contrary. And that is studies that we have show that timely access to health care is indeed not, uh, not costing more, but is cost saving. So on the contrary, if the success is not given, this will at least double economic costs of treatments. And it will multiply, especially when you think of infectious diseases like TB um, and uh, when you think of multimorbidities. So to make a very long story short, uh, there is evidence that there is a cost saving potential in giving universal access to healthcare. And I can give you some numbers on this. It's, a, it's a ranging around 50% uh, to up to 99% for specific uh, interventions that can be saved if you uh, allow uh, early access to treatments. To give you one example, high blood pressure, um, an important issue. If you treat uh, blood, high blood pressure in primary care, this will save up to 90% of the costs of an operation that becomes necessary as a result of no treatment. So you see the cost saving potential, if you look in, into this in detail, is really great. A second example, uh, diabetes, diabetes type 2. Um, very important uh, uh, as numbers of people affected by diabetes are growing and people are in very early age, in young age, are, um, are affected. Uh, an economic study showed here that uh, the uh, cost-saving potential of primary care treatment of diabetes is 74% uh, compared to hospitalization that becomes necessary without such a treatment. So again, you see uh, with this example that the cost-saving potential of providing universal uh, access to health care is great. And the good thing is that there is increasing evidence on that. Another aspect, just very briefly to tackle, is when we talk about economics, and if we take a broader aspect on that, we also have to think about uh, productivity and loss of productivity, loss of income. So these are economic uh, considerations that really do not only tackle or uh, approach to the healthcare systems, but also to societies in general. And just to remind us, I mean, health and being in good health is the number one determinant of mastering process of integration. 
mm. I think, mm. for a first answer. <laughs> okay. okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I'd quite like to turn to M Michaela at this point um, because it does sound like that there are challenges in bringing to together data. Um, there's good sort of case studies of, of sort of data being used um, to inform policy. But, but it, I, I was at um, a recent um, health research symposium and some of the kind of same issues were coming up which was about how do we connect research to policy? And I wonder whether you might be able to reflect on that. Thanks a lot, Paul, um, and thanks also for IOM uh, inviting me to this panel. So I think it's great to have such a, a lunch event. So um, I think data and evidence is important. It is very important, but let me also be a little bit uh, devil's advocate here, yeah, if you permit. I think data and evidence cannot be seen in isolation either. So in some ways, we also need to we need to also um, challenge sometimes the evidence and the data we get because yes, and we have heard from Frank, you know, we need to have, there's lack of data, we need more data or we need better use of data, but we also have misuse of data and we also have distortion of data. And that's the moment when we actually need to look into a political context, when we cannot isolate data from the political context in which we use the data, in which actually the data is embedded. And I think that's where I'm challenging it. So in some ways, you know, at the time of fake news, that's our political environment, we need to be aware of that and we have to talk about that. Um, so we have to challenge evidence sometimes and we have to challenge data. And so we have to challenge the figures, but also sometimes even, you know, um, even more so, I think, sometimes even the research in itself, because it brings us a lot of data, but it gives us a delay in, using, in being able to use the data. By the time we are able to have the full data collection done, yeah, well evidenced, the policy debate is over. So what do you do? So there's a challenge there. But then it's also sometimes the challenge around what, do you, what approach you take. And I think that brings me right back in what you have said in terms of the con disconnection, the connection of you know, data and evidence and realities, political realities. And that's really what I want to talk here. Because uh, it is true, yeah, data collection can have an impact and should inform policy, but decisions are made not necessarily on the basis of data. So, and not on the basis of evidence. So decisions are made, governance decisions are made within a political view. And so what we have here, we, we operate, and so what we also have is that disconnection and we work in silos. We have clearly a fragmentation where we work in different systems. We have a health system, we have a migration system, we have a development system, we have a humanitarian system. Now, sometimes these systems overlap, but sometimes also they operate in their own little bubble. And if you look at the governance level, where do they interface? If you come here to the IOM Council, I would be really interested to, to, to look at the composition of the delegates here at the Council and compare that composition with the composition of the delegates of the World Health Assembly. Now clearly it might not be the same. Sometimes it might overlap, but sometimes it might not be the same. Now there you have already a disconnect. So policy making at that governance level actually doesn't match. <laughs> you need to bring them together. You have to have a Ministry of Health representative in this room to talk about migration. And of course we know we need to have that. We need to talk health as a political agenda. As we have to talk migration as a health agenda but we don't do that sufficiently. And of course, it's very nice that we are here and have this lunch event, so what I would ask, we have this event, we have a panel right after, a high-level panel, we have a film festival at the Graduate Institute tonight. What happens tomorrow? We will still talk about health? What happens the day after? Will we have still talk about health? 
or is that just a punctual intervention, very fought for and needed? I don't say that. But you know, how can we actually bring it into the mindset in terms of, you know, it's an approach which needs to change? Um, so, uh, thank you very much, Michaela. I, I think we've got a few minutes where I think it would be good to have some reflections on what we've heard so far. Frank, you said that you would like to say something. Any, anybody else on the panel keen to reflect? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and Matteo. So, um, yeah. Okay. And Matteo. So, yes, I agree with everything that was said by the last speaker. I think, um, to some extent, the Global Compact on Migration and its section dealing with data recognizes that if you want to improve data, you also have to have a communication strategy and you need to communicate data more effectively. And there's some brief reference to public opinion um, in that section of the compact. It's probably not enough. But I think the more important point is that the compact describes 11 actions which should be taken to improve data on migration, but it poses the whole discussion, or sets the discussion, I think, essentially within a sort of technical framework. So um, the argument that's put is, you know, if only we had more surveys or more questions in censuses on migration, et cetera, et cetera, or if we spent more on capacity building, then we'd have more data and we'd begin to solve our problems. Well, clearly we wouldn't because there are many sensitivities around data. Data is a highly political issue. Countries may decide to collect certain forms of data and they may decide that they don't want to share that information either internally or with other countries. So one of the things that we have been talking about, I think in IOM, is the importance of what I would call in inverted commas, data dialogue. I mean, you have to recognize that there are many different ministries, stakeholders within a country collecting data on different aspects of migration, and they don't always come together and share the information, or do they don't come together and think about, well, what's our national strategy? What evidence do we really need on migration? Um, IOM over a number of years has promoted the idea that countries should develop country migration profiles and those profiles are prepared in consultation with governments to set, set up interministerial working groups where ministries like the Ministry of Health is often represented. But it's, but it's been slow, we've made slow progress and I think we need to do much more in that area. Um, the other thing that we need to do is to encourage countries to share data and to work together um, to identify um, you know, common areas where they all have an interest in having some data perhaps at the sub-regional or regional level or even across continents. Um, because migration always involves more than one country unless we're talking about IDPs and internal movements. Um, so um, when we're thinking about action steps, and this isn't really fully addressed, I think, specifically in the compact under data, but the compact does stress the importance of international cooperation in order to be able to manage migration effectively, um, then I think that's an important um, element of this debate. So that's where I think the WHO and the IOM connection and the connection with the different ministries and stakeholders come in. Just one last point, 20 years ago, I was in a room near here. I organized a meeting with government officials about research and policy and how do you bring the two communities together. And we had slides up on the screen. Um, the researchers have a set of stereotypes about policymakers. They, they, they don't know anything about research. They're very impatient. The policymakers have stereotypes about the researchers, they're so slow, they're always talking about theory, they don't, have, they don't deal with practical problems. So how do you bring these two communities together is um, something that we've been talking about for a long time. It's not easy to get everyone in the same room together and to bridge that gap. Uh, and I welcome people's thoughts on how to really make progress in this area because um, there have been, I think, many initiatives over the years trying to tackle this issue. Th thanks a lot, Frank. Um, Carl, can I just check, you, were you waving because you wanted to say something? Because yeah. uh, let, <laughs> let me go to Matteo first, he had his hand up and then I'll come back to you. Matteo. Yeah, thank you. My, my comment builds on what you have just said. Uh, 
you know, uh, of course my experience is about tuberculosis. It's, 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 it's very, very limited. Mm -hmm. But uh, there we, we, we have an opportunity. Uh, the, the, the TB research networks that I mentioned, they are exactly that. They are, they are led by researchers and uh, uh, program people in countries. They set up their own agenda and uh, they don't work just in their own countries, but they, they work with the neighbors in most cases. That's, a, I think, a perfect platform to uh, you know, uh, really st st start moving this and have, have, have uh, uh, projects uh, in the ground to make, make uh, uh, you know, what we are discussing more a reality. And you know, in, in what I've seen for other research issues, um, when you have researchers and uh, program persons uh, in the same room, you, uh, it may be the process is a bit slow sometimes, but you have both the political will and the means to make things moving. So uh, that would be my suggestion, to really start from uh, uh, lo more local and sub, you know, sub-regional uh, work. Uh, to, to try to, to really uh, move forward uh, with this agenda. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so we're going to go to Carl, we're going to go to <laughs> Usla, and then we're going to go back to Michaela, and then we'll uh, move into the next phase. Thanks, Paul. Yes, agree with that point exactly. I think what we see happening at the sub-regional level and the sub-national level around migration health governance is, is quite um, amazing. There are countries that are meeting for economic purposes, economic cooperation uh, mechanisms, free movement of people, and grafting migration health um, as agenda items on that. And a good example of that is the Colombo process, where it's a meeting of member states that are uh, labor sending countries, um, recognizing the importance of um, uh, looking at research, evidence about say, cause of death, mortality uh, of, of migrant workers abroad. Um, so I think these increasingly are becoming important for regional cooperation processes in, in, in migration governance. But I just, I mean, doctors like to prescribe things, and, and <laughs> when you're dealing with a patient that's a country, people don't like to be prescribed things. But I think a, a very general compass is identifying a focal point at a country level uh, to drive this agenda, as, as Frank said, through an intersectoral process is, is important. Doing a lot of mapping of domestic legal frameworks to, to, to look at to what extent is the right to health enshrined for, for the non-citizens, for example. Mapping actors. I mean, a lot of this stuff could be done as, as the first step in, in, in um, identifying what capacity gaps exist at a country level before embarking on any sort of policy formulary. So I think, uh, and this doesn't require a lot of money, it, it requires a lot of will and a, a, a sort of a, a technical uh, expertise to do this, but I, I think taking stock of existing dynamics is important. Thanks. Thank you, Carl. Um, Ursula, you had an intervention. <coughs> Yeah, I just wanted to refer to a third stakeholder when it comes to, to data uh, production, also data protection, and that, that is, uh, the, these are the NGOs, uh, especially when it comes to vulnerable migrant groups, like, for example, irregular migrants. Most data concerning uh, health status, but also access to health care, will be produced by uh, NGOs who provide services. So. There is some data f from their side, but the question is how can this be properly connected to researchers or, or also to, to uh, policy and uh, political actors? That's an open question. I don't have an answer. Uh, and the second thing I wanted to mention, I find is very interesting what you said about this uh, uh, conference you made on how to, how to <laughs> bring together researchers and, and political actors. Because right now, I, I guess next year in February, there will start a European network of scholars who are addressing exactly this issue. How can research uh, address properly uh, political stakeholders? How can this gap between research on one hand and policy making on the other side be closed? It's within the Horizon 2020 program. They will work on that for four years, so maybe it would be worthwhile to, to exchange uh, results. So we'll know in four years. Um, 
Michaela, you wanted to make a, a comment before we move into the next phase. Yeah, I can actually just um, reply <laughs> <laughs> to the question also asked. <laughs> and I would say, speak a different language. Yeah. Speak the same language. Get into a coherent language. We speak different, we are also in different language silos. We speak a very different language in health. We talk all the time about evidence. It's really lovely. But it doesn't resonate with anybody who is a diplomat. I mean, it is useful at that moment when they want to use it because it makes their argument stronger, but it doesn't resonate otherwise. So speak a different language. Speak the language which resonates sometimes. It's a question, it's, it's, a, it's an emotional language. It's about emotions. It, it is about values and human beings, but it's about the human being next to us, sitting next to me. So speak a different language which everybody in the room can understand and connect to. But it also means that we need to get out of the framing. So I mean, I think it's really interesting, Frank, because you mentioned, you know, the Global Compact has been within this technical framework. Mm. And so I would say yes. And so what the problem is we face in Europe, and of course my own country is part of that, withdrawing from the Global Compact. So it's about the political framing. Well, yes, it's nice to have the technical framing, but ultimately you need the political framing in which you act. Because otherwise, well, you, you have to drop out. And so then what is the value? How can you still work with it? Of course, we will work with it. And of course, it has its value. I don't challenge that. But I'm just, you know, making the argument here. And I think it is also, it, for me, it also means, you know, do we need to learn better from the past, from experience, from the research we have? So how far actually we are able to learn? <laughs> Are we able to learn and adapt ourselves? We know what's going to happen. We know we have experienced it so many times. That, but do we ever learn? Can we please use the data and the evidence we have and build on that for the future? Thanks, Michaela. Um, I would like to move us on just because I've got a, an eye on the clock and it would be good if there was uh, questions from the floor that, that we get the opportunity to hear them. Um, so um, I'm going to ask each panel member, perhaps moving from right to left, or my right to, to the left, um, just to sum up, you know, their kind of concluding thoughts, comments in uh, sort of three minutes, no more, because we're, we're now, uh, we're tight. But um, just what are your take home messages? Now, we've got the, comp uh, the compact on the, on the horizon. It's going to be the kind of compass for us moving forward. So, what's, what's your message? Cole, would you like to start? Yeah, well, that's, that's a challenging one. Um, I'd say mainstreaming migration health within, uh, within health discourses, migration and health seems to be sidelined. And within migration governance discourses, uh, health seems to be sidelined. So, I think. Mainstreaming is very important, um, and and to do that, um, the, I mean, I'd, I'd like to push back a little bit about what Michaela just mentioned. We've we've done some analysis about existing data, and we've found on the heat map of of data and who's producing data in migration health, there's entire vacuums from the global south. Um, we don't have enough research and evidence from these regions. So even with the existing data set, it's very much a, a labor um, a receiving or, or indeed a, a, a migration receiving uh, perspective. So I think we really need to improve research capacities uh, in order to, do, to even mainstream migration. Thanks. Yeah, so um, I think my message would be um, ultimately what I also mentioned earlier, I think, is also to change the approach in research. And that approach to be, and maybe challenge the research we do as that fundamental research, but move into applied research, really, but also move into a research which is much more of a hybrid format, where you actually bring people together, where you actually, on the one hand, have your policy dialogues, where you interact constantly, and at the same time also do your data collection and bring in your data collection as you also dialogue and bring different stakeholders together. And it's not just governments, and as Ursula rightly said, also NGOs and many other stakeholders need to come in yeah, into that debate. 
private sector? Do we talk to the private sector in migration? I think it's to, to provide a different approach in research and provide a different form of platform and outreach. Thanks very much. Um, Frank, would you like to? Okay. Yeah, very briefly on the private sector. I think that's increasingly important given the amount of data that's being generated by the private sector. To just give one example, mobile phone data has been used to track the movement of malaria infected populations between Zanzibar and Tanzania. There's probably lots of data that is being produced by the private sector not being fully utilized by different stakeholders, uh, stakeholders and policymakers today. So we're going to need much more public-private interaction in the future. I think the key messages will be um, we need to develop comprehensive data strategies working with countries and regions according to their priorities and uh, start by making the best use of what already exists and giving, uh, helping policymakers and others to um, use what data already exists. And, um, and then I agree with Cole that the emphasis really needs to be on building data capacities in the global south, because that's really where we most lack um, information at the moment. I don't have time to list a whole bunch of things that IOM is doing or planning to do in response to the GCM data agenda. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, I may repeat myself, but I think that we do need more evidence on economics of health and migration. What we know so far is that exclusion is expensive. What we don't know so far yet, who is really paying the price maybe the taxpayer, maybe humanity. So I think we need to get better evidence on this. I also think that we need to, um, to encourage researchers and policymakers to get into dialogue. We, I, I think we agreed that somehow uh, researchers do not have the impact with their data and with their knowledge and the evidence that they could have and should have. And I think to develop maybe a common knowledge uh, and the common language would be one important uh, step to better link evidence to relevance because this link is missing so far. And I think a third thing for me concerning capacity building is one very important thing is, and this is bringing researchers globally together. And there is one wonderful network that has just been starting to do that, and this is Madri. And maybe you did see these folders somewhere outside. Um, you're very welcome to take them with you and share them with you, share them with uh, uh, people you know. Madri is a unique network that brings together researchers from all over the world, and we know that especially in concerning research, health, and migration, um, the Global South is not that much integrated also in research processes that it should be. And this should change, and I think that Madri as a network will be part of this change. Wonderful, thank you. Matteo? Yes, uh, universal health coverage is clearly at the center of uh, uh, the work of, of WHO, and uh, the, the new administration has really put uh, UHC at the core of our work, and we should clearly uh, ensure that migrants are part of that sort of movement. Um, my, uh, I have two points, basically, many related to the work. I think tuberculosis could be um, uh, a, a good way, a, a, good, a good starting point to, um, uh, to, 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 to basically create um, um, uh, ownership in countries on, on data uh, uh, on migration. I think there is high political momentum for tuberculosis control. Migration is clearly a, a major problem. Uh, and, you know, and the networks that I mentioned earlier uh, are already existing and could be um, a, a platform where, where uh, work can really, uh, can really start. Um, fr from, uh, from the WHO side, in particular from my side, there is full commitment uh, to support as much as possible this work on migration. 
Wonderful, thank you all. Um, we've done very well and we're, we're back on track, by, uh, so it's good discipline from the panel. Um, I wondered whether we had some questions from the floor. Um, we've got 10 or 15 minutes that where we could take questions if, if there's any burning uh, questions that we want. Um, if there's, we've got one at the back, um, I, I hope that your microphone works. Yes, it's not Palau, but my name is, <laughs> <laughs> my name is Florian Forst. I'm the, from IOM. I'm the head of Immigration and Border Management. And I have a question specifically related to the migration health research agenda. I understand there's a lot, lot of lack of research, especially in the south, on uh, migration and health. And what kind of primary data would you need uh, from, from, from the first uh, contacts at the borders, you know, is there something where you feel is it an appropriate uh, moment and space anyhow in the first place and if so, what kind of data would you need from those uh, civil servants interacting as a first uh, person on the line with arriving migrants? What uh, is data that then would help you to further research uh, in this area? Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Is there another question? We could take an, a number at once, so we can start with this one. Who on the panel would like to, to tackle that question? I'm sort of looking at you, Cole. Yeah. So the question relates to um, what sort of data or, or research could be done um, at the border points of entry and exit. So as you know, the international health regulations and global health security is a, is a critical aspect of, of um, uh, global health. Um, what we find is that um, in IOM's work within the realm of global health security, um, the point at which people cross could be through airports, seaports, and land crossings. And what's been quite weak is the kind of research done at the, the nexus between populations that are crossing land borders. Um, if you look at the Ebola outbreak that happened uh, in 2014, um, capacities about mapping human mobility and superimposing those maps on epidemiological mapping. So this is where points of entry research are, are really critical. So you can have some sort of real-time um, um, analyses around how people are moving, what typologies of people, uh, what is the direction of flows. And IOM's developed um, some pretty good tools in that realm um, that uh, could be uh, portable or exportable to different contexts. So that's, that's one. But, but also, you, I think there's, um, uh, as Frank mentioned, there, there, there are methods around using technologies, uh, around um, mobile phone use, for example, to, to map people, how they move through borders. Um, and also, from a, a very applied research aspect, IOM has been doing a, a research study uh, uh, during the Ebola outbreak where we, we looked at people that are screened at airports, at points of entry. So we partnered with the uh, immigration authorities and the health authorities, and we looked at um, those scanning machines, uh, temperature scanning machines, the, the, the infrared uh, scanners, whether or not that was effective in picking up uh, uh, um, uh, cases uh, of suspected uh, people with uh, syndromic-based uh, case detection. So I think there are different research strategies that one can apply at the points of entry. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Carl. I think, Soleil, you had a response? Yeah, it comes under the question, which kind of data? I would have a long, long wish list. Mm. <laughs> can share it with you. Um, but I think uh, most important would be data on the health status, of course, um, uh, on the health needs that people have when they come, but also on expectations that they bring uh, with them and that guide maybe a future behavior. And I learned that IOM, for example, did develop a, a so-called EPHR, a personal health record, that uh, was designed to uh, collect that kind of data uh, in first-line assessments. I don't know whether you're familiar with that, but this would be the first things in my wish list. Thank you. Jacqueline, you would like to make a comment? Yeah, actually I have uh, two comments. Uh, 
Well, I'm, I'm glad to see that, uh, in fact, we are practicing what we preach, aren't we, by having a health lead discussion in a migration uh, platform. So I think that's, that's good, because <laughs> that's what, what all of the panelists somehow were saying. We have to mix the different sectors. I think we're doing that. Sorry, I have to put on my glasses. Uh, the other thing I wanted to, wanted to say is that, that triggered, your question triggered that is, um, and it was mentioned earlier, we, uh, use of data is very important. We should not misuse data. I want to mention something in this context because, context because we can, of course, prove a lot of theories with, with data, but we have to be very balanced. And one thing is we have to be cautious about is we don't want to stigmatize migrants, which is happening a lot and will only fuel the already negative narrative. We don't want to stigmatize migrants as disease carriers. The whole message should be how can we better prepare uh, health systems, how can we prepare uh, for integration uh, by knowing what the health status is of migrants who, who may be coming to a community. That's one. The other thing also is that um, we should also be very cautious of, of looking into health status of people by, with, with questionnaires, research questions, if we do not attach with that the access to health services. It doesn't do any justice to people if they are researched about certain needs that they may have and then there is no response that follows. And this is something that was very, very much underlined in a very recent meeting that was organized by the government of, um, of Belgium as well as uh, an uh, IOM uh, on uh, um, uh, a big program that the IOM had, Peter Parcher Health Assessments. And uh, yes, very important, Free departure health assessments at the moment that we encounter people, what can we ask, but also what can we deliver? How can we respond to the needs that we discover that these populations have? Thank you very much. Um, Michaela, you, you yeah, want to Yeah, just, just a quick thought, and that goes in line with what I've said earlier, but I think just as a, a different flavor here, I think what, and in migration you do that quite a bit, but in health you don't do that much, but you need to also collect political intelligence. So basically, you need to have also a, a sense of history in the country and in the two countries, you have to have a sense of the political system, you have a sense of the policies and the legal framework. So there is a lot of other data than the just the, the strong and very, you know, data <laughs> we're talking about here. So I think there is a lot of intelligence around it, which we need because that influences ultimately also in which ways can you actually implement policies or advance or change policies or push for policies. Um, Matteo, I wonder whether you, you might comment on it from a TV perspective because one of the challenges of TV is, is, is that people have a long um, period of time where they have the disease if they're in treatment but keeping people in treatment after they've moved through a border. Yeah, I, I think I think uh, the question can, can, you know could be also seen from the pr perspective of control programs, not just for, for, from the perspective of uh, of, of the migrants, uh, but also from the pr perspective of control programs who have the duty to monitor what's happening in their own countries. And uh, uh, you know there are clearly questions. Uh, particularly when it comes to infection disease, transmissible disease, that uh, Municipal Health, I think, would like to have. Uh, uh, I, I'm not sure if the border, you know, it's, it's the right, you know, place uh, to, to, to collect the information, but um, my, my sense is that we probably don't, uh, don't often go back to, to the control programs in countries to ask which are the questions that uh, uh, you will need, uh, which are the type of data that you will need to, uh, uh, you know, to, to monitor uh, and, and to control the disease in your country. And I, I'm pretty sure that, there is, for example, for TB, there are lots of questions that, that program managers ha have uh, all the time, uh, and uh, particularly, you know, the issue of, uh, you know, you know, uh, unique identifiers for patients, how you ensure that patients uh, can be recognized, the issue of uh, being able to transfer, the, you know, the information from one country to another. It's sensitive information, but uh, it, it has to be transferred. And, uh, and, and, and then the issue of ensuring that uh, 
uh, the patients, first of all, finish the treatment, but the results are also reported back so that uh, whoever is in charge of, of, the, of a program, in this case a TB control program, uh, has an understanding of, of uh, a full understanding of what's happening basically in the country. Great, thank you very much, Matteo. Was there any other questions from the floor? We've got time for one, if would you? Um, I might be a bit controversial here, just to keep the um, audience lively. Um, and, and it's mainly directed at you, Frank, and building on what Matteo has just said, that in a health perspective, sorry, I'm from IOM, um, thank you. Uh, from a health perspective, we would say you would not screen unless you intended to treat. Um, and if I look at the research, are we in trouble here that research is collecting data without any intention to change policy? So shouldn't it be the policy makers who are actually engaging with the researchers to determine what are those questions they need answered? I, th I think that's more a question for the MHD department. <laughs> Carl? No comment. All right. Um, I don't know whether anybody else feels like they can comment on that. Should leave it hanging there. Come on, guys. <laughs> Let's uh, comment. <laughs> It would be lovely if policymakers would actually engage in research. The question is whether they would do it. And therefore, you know, there are clear roles as well and different mandates. And I think that we need to respect as well. Mm -hmm. But that's why also I think a hybrid approach towards research is so important because that's precisely when you bring them together. And, you know, not just have a finalized research project done and then present data. That's the train is gone by the time. Yeah, probably. <laughs> but actually engage on the way throughout, you know, and I think that's where you actually keep a certain level of relevance. So the policymaker may not be the, the person who is able to engage, but he can also inform your research just as much as you as a researcher can inform policy making. And of course we would want to have this mutual relationship. But that, again, is a different way of looking at things, that you have actually a partnership set up here in terms of a dialogue which is not just, you know, where you work in silos once again, but where you actually come together and talk to each other. And what it, what it does require is, and of course, we as the, the Credit Institute, we do that quite a bit, is working on global health diplomacy. It's precisely, you know, trying to, to merge those views, but also to build those relationships, to build trust. And I think... These are elements which are just outside of the purely technical realm, in a sense, because on that basis, in fact, you can move on and move together. Thanks, Maybe. Michaela. I, I think Cole, give me a signal, and then Matteo. I think, <laughs> thanks for the question. Uh, well, I, look, I think it's, it's quite important that, uh, that research is done even on the same research question in different contexts. And I'll give a very practical example of this. Um, when we did research studies in Philippines and in Sri Lanka and in Bangladesh about the mental health and the nutritional status of children that were, quote unquote, left behind by migrant workers, the effects on child mental health and, in, and child nutrition in the Sri Lankan child was pathological. Like it was, it, the scales were pathological. Whereas in the, in the Filipino left behind child, they were thriving. They, in fact, when we looked at the data, they were, they were nutritionally better off than a, than a non-migrant child comparatively. It's so important that research is done um, and, and imagine the, the policy consequence of, of, of that data. So I think it's, it's really important to do uh, applied research, research that's contextualized, but different results can happen in different countries. And we, and just from that point, there's a difference in communal rearing of children, for example, in Philippines, and a host, a host of factors where um, people, governments there enable migration in, in different ways. And I think there's a lot to say about the importance of research for policy making. And I think, I hope that example also highlights the need to invest in applied research agendas. Um, Jacqueline, I think you wanted to uh, just add a, yeah, a brief sure. comment. Yeah, uh, that was a great comment, uh, Paul, and uh, I think uh, 
the Sri Lanka example was actually a good example of the participatory approach and really mixing the policy and, and the research worlds. But we have to also bear in mind, when we talk about participatory approaches, and they have to be not only at the very end, but throughout the entire process, we should definitely not forget the migrants, because let's be real, the migrants are not vulnerable, poor people only. I mean, the migrants are very innovative people, and maybe the strongest and the smartest. So when we talk about participatory approaches, also when it's about research matters, they may actually be very good uh, participants in when are we talking about developing of research or how to interpret research and what is it that also they need because they have to also, uh, uh, they have a lot to say as well and we should see them as full participants as well. Thank you, that was exactly my comment. Uh, <laughs> but there is, a, there is a fourth group, I think, in addition to, to the civil society, to the migrants, uh, and, uh, which is important, I think, it's, it's the funders. And we, we often for, forget about them. But in my experience is that when you have the table, uh, the, the, you know, the, the programs or the public health uh, people, the researchers, the civil society, and the funders, is that, that is where you have the, the right mix to move a research agenda forward. In my, in my experience, you know, uh, of course, research is free, and uh, it's a beauty of research is to explore and, and see and, and look for opportunities. This has to be, it has to remain. But my experience, when the, the, the country, the, the, you know, the program identifies research questions, clear research questions, at least in my area of tuberculosis, when they are able to identify those questions, they get funded. Because funders, they, they, they see the relevance of, uh, of, of a question which is for the benefit of uh, public health in the country. So that is a, a player that I think we should not, we should really include in our, at our table. Um, thank you very much, um, Matteo. So um, I'm trying to keep closely to time. So I think, we, I, I think I'll use my privilege just uh, to highlight uh, something that the British Medical Journal is, uh, is, is doing uh, with the IOM. Um, spearheaded by coal and uh, with the uh, Madri network. So um, clearly this is a, a topic that's very important to the journal. So we'll be embarking on um, uh, publishing a special series um, on migration and health, um, looking at the research agenda for migration and health. Um, the first of those papers we'll, we'll probably publish early next year and they're gonna start on governance, UHC and othering. Um, but one of the things I think that the British Medical Journal um, really does well is it mixes academic rigor with um, sort of journalistic flair. So not only are we gonna have some um, fairly weighty academic pieces, but we're gonna um, also be publishing features written by uh, journalists, and we will also be publishing multimedia infographics and, and podcasts as well. Um, so do look out for that next year, um, and probably uh, if you're not already following Madri on, on Twitter, then that would be a good place to, uh, to keep up to date. <laughs> okay, so um, we are on time, um, and I think that all I'm left to do is to thank you for listening and to thank the panel, because I think it's been really interesting. So thanks all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.